The democratic peace theory is the claim that democracies rarely fight one another because they share common norms of live and let live and contain domestic institutions that constrain the recourse to war. It is perhaps the most powerful liberal contribution to the debate on the causes of war and peace. The idea is theoretically rooted in the work of Immanuel Kant, who in an essay titled Perpetual Peace, written in 1795, argued that interactions between states with a Republican form of government give a favorable prospect for a perpetual peace. Democratic peace theorists note a powerful empirical generalization. Democracies rarely go to war or engage in militarized disputes with one another. The political scientist Jack Levy wrote in a 1988 article called Domestic Politics and War that the quote, absence of war between democratic states comes as close to anything we have to an empirical law in international relations, end quote. Most studies agree on the substantive findings. The more democratic a dyad of states is, the less likely they are to be involved in conflict. The arguments suggest, and the evidence supports, what scholars call a dyadic democratic peace, that democracies do not fight with one another. On the other hand, the research does not support the idea of a monadic peace, that democracies are more peaceful in general. The empirical evidence, in fact, suggests that democratic states are in general about as conflict and war prone as non-democracies, but democracies have rarely clashed with one another in violent conflict. So what is the evidence for a democratic peace? We can look to the data to see if it supports the notion that democracies do not engage in militarized disputes with one another. The Polity Data Series, with the current version known as Polity 4, contains coded annual information on the level of democracy for most nation states covering the years 1800 to 2018. For each year and country, a polity score is determined, which ranges in numerical value from negative 10 to positive 10. Nation states with scores of negative 10 to negative 6 correspond to autocracies or dictatorships. Nations with scores of minus 5 to 5 correspond to anocracies, or in other words, states with a form of government that is mostly dictatorship, but has some democratic features. Finally, a polity score of six to 10 represents a functioning democracy. As such, a country can be identified as a democratic regime when its score in the polity category is not below six, so a dyad of liberal democracy must be one in which either side's score is six or higher. According to the Correlates of War Project, which is an academic study of the history of warfare, notes that from 1816 to 2007, there have been 95 interstate wars around the world, but none of them happened between two countries that scored at least a six on the polity four scale. That is, there is no incidence of war between two democratic countries. The question then is, why do democracies not fight other democracies? What creates this dyadic democratic peace? There are three main arguments for explaining the democratic peace. Number one, institutional or structural constraints. Number two, norms that shape state behavior. And finally, number three, economic interdependence between democracies, which reduces the likelihood of war. Let's discuss all three in greater detail. First, let's talk about institutional constraints in democracies. The structural account argues that due to the complexity of the democratic process and the requirement of securing a broad base of support for risky policies, democratic leaders are reluctant to wage wars, except in cases wherein war seems a necessity or when the war aims are seen as justifying the mobilization cost. These complex political mobilization processes impose institutional constraints on the leaders of democracies confronting each other that makes violent conflict undesirable. Democratic leaders give careful consideration before engaging in militarized disputes because the cost and risk of war directly affect 
large segments of the population, and it is expected that the average voter will throw the incumbent leader or party out of office if they initiate a losing or unnecessary war, thus providing a clear institutional incentive for democratic leaders to anticipate such an electoral response before deciding to go to war. Also, the time required for democracies to prepare for war is much longer than for non-democracies. This gives diplomats more time to secure a peaceful settlement before war can break out. Therefore, democracies tend to have institutional structures which make it more difficult for the leadership to bring the nation to war. The second explanation of a democratic peace centers on normative constraints that exist within democratic countries. Proponents of the normative logic argue that one important effect of democracy is to socialize political elites to act on the basis of democratic norms whenever possible. Democracies tend to value negotiation, compromise, and the rights of others. The normative model suggests that democracies do not fight each other because norms of compromise and cooperation prevent their conflicts of interest from escalating into violent clashes. The externalization of domestic norms affects state behavior. These norms mandate nonviolent conflict resolution and negotiation in a spirit of live and let live. Because democratic leaders are committed to these norms, they try as far as possible to adopt them in the international arena in particular with other democratic states. Further, when disputes between democracies arise, the expectation that conflicts can be settled peacefully lowers the relative benefit to be achieved from violence. However, when democracies encounter non-democracies, conflict is possible because the international system of anarchy demands that democratic states succumb to non-democratic norms in order to maintain security. In other words, in the absence of shared norms, conflict is more likely. The third and final argument that explains a democratic peace is that of economic interdependence. Democratic states have free market economies, and since they are better able to offer credible commitments regarding the terms of trade and capital flows than authoritarian states, they are more inclined to trade with one another. Interdependence promotes peace by increasing contacts among democracies and contributing to mutual understanding. Trade helps create transnational ties that encourage accommodation rather than conflict. Furthermore, trade is mutually beneficial to its participants and war may negatively affect a country's economy because it could potentially cut off critical imports or exports. Finally, trade tends to decrease the benefits of conquest. Thus, the potential loss of trade decreases the willingness of both sides to fight. In conclusion, the evidence shows us that the more democratic the dyad is, the less likely that dyad is to go to war. The implication is that if democracies are more peaceful with other democracies, then as the number of democratic states in the international system increases, we might expect to achieve a systemic democratic peace. Are there challenges to the democratic peace argument? There are. Some scholars have argued that there are troublesome cases for the democratic peace theory that includes, for example, the War of 1812, the U.S. Civil War, the Fashoda Crisis, the Spanish-American War, and the Cargill Conflict of 1999 between India and Pakistan. However, if we examine each of these cases in further detail, we will see that one or more of states in those dyads did not rise to the level of a liberal democracy. For example, in the War of 1812, the polity four score of the United States was nine, indicating that it was a strong liberal democracy by the standards of the time. However, the United Kingdom's polity four score was a negative two, indicating that it was a state with significant authoritarian features. So it really does not rise to a proper test of democratic peace theory. It's important to note that very few democracies existed before the end of World War II. So a better test of democratic peace is how history unfolds over the next 50 to 100 years. As more states become institutionalized democracies, does militarized dispute ensue and rise to the level of war? or are differences settled peacefully due to institutional, normative, and economic interdependence constraints.
So that's the video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and please also feel free to subscribe for additional videos on contemporary topics in comparative politics and international relations. Thanks for watching and have a great day.